Hello and welcome to the Wake Up Call podcast. Instead of airing a current events episode for our Thursday episode this week, we're airing a conversation we had on August 29, 2014 with Dr. Kevin Gutzman about three then-recent court cases, Burwell v. Hobby Lobby, Halbig v. Burwell, and Riley v. California. Dr. Gutzman is a professor of history at Western Connecticut State University and previously worked as an attorney. He is the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Constitution, Virginia's American Revolution, and James Madison and the Making of America. You can follow his work at kevingutzman.com. That's Kevin, G-U-T-Z-M-A-N.com. You can also find him on Facebook and on Twitter under the handle at Kevin Gutzman. He has courses on American history, the U.S. Constitution, and the American Revolution that are available at libertyclassroom.com, and you can find more of his work there. For more information, please see the show notes page for this episode at wakeupcallpodcast.com slash hobby hyphen lobby. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, today we're here with Kevin Gutzman, and we're going to talk about various court cases. But before we start, uh, we believe that your book was featured on the very popular show House of Cards. Can you uh, explain that briefly to us and tell us how that came to be? Well, uh, I got an email one day from a fellow who said to me, how did your book get to be on House of Cards? And I said, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> and uh, this was actually, I guess, a Facebook message from a fellow I had never heard of in Florida. I live in Connecticut. And he said, wait a minute. And then he sent me screen captures from, I think, four different episodes in season two. <laughs> so he said, I've, I've been uh, binge watching the new episode today, and I've seen your book. And in fact, he says, I'm going to check and see whether it was in last season's show. And actually, he went back to season one and found it sitting on the bookshelf in a couple of episodes in season one. But there's one episode in season two where Kevin Spacey's standing around reading it, and then he's walking around carrying it, and then he throws it on a table. So <laughs> what, what role did uh, St. Martin's Press and Macmillan Publishing uh, publicity people have in this? So the answer is none at all. They... Uh, they signed an interesting looking cover and that was about their entire uh, contribution and I, as I say I didn't even know about it until um, it, all of season two had been out there so they didn't know about it Macmillan didn't know about it through all of season one and only fortuitously did I hear about it in season two anyway this guy sent me uh, a link to a place online where he had put several of screen captures showing Kevin Spacey in the book <laughs> presently it's on the bookshelf behind Kevin Spacey when he's sitting at his desk. So um, I posted on Facebook, and then several people said, oh, yeah, I knew that last year. <laughs> Stop telling me, guys. That was very helpful. I actually haven't seen the American version, although I did watch the British version some years ago, as I recall. I understand that Spacey's... Uh, character Spacey himself and the series were up for various awards, and I don't know whether that included the actual episode where he's shown reading the book. But people then started asking me, "Well, why would Kevin Spacey uh, be shown reading your book?" And my answer was a lot of mumbo jumbo about uh, ambitious politicians. But of course, I don't know. It's a <laughs> it's a Hollywood product. How would I know? So there you go. That's far less interesting than I'm sure you anticipated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's move on to our first court case, which would be Burwell v. Hobby Lobby. This has been talked about in the news a lot, but can you give us just a brief overview about what the case is about? Well, sure. Of course, uh, the, parent, uh, the uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act uh, requires employers to provide health insurance to various classes, uh, I should say various classes of employers to provide health insurance to various employees and a particular group of employers, uh, that is the uh, owners of a closely held corporation, Hobby Lobby, decided that providing all 20 of the listed um, contraceptive uh, methods would violate their religious commitments and so uh, went to court with 
the assertion that this amounted to a violation of the First Amendment to the Free Exercise Clause. And ultimately, the court said, well, yes, in a case like this, in which you have a closely held corporation, requiring the corporation to provide these um, methods of contraception that are violative of these particular people's religious commitments is a violation of the Free Exercise Clause. So um, they held that in that narrow set of circumstances, then uh, only 16 of the 20 contraceptive methods had to be provided, not all 20 of them. And the ones that were outside the requirement thus tailored were the ones that had abortifacient qualities. So I guess it could be that somebody who was uh, of a more um, mainline uh, religious persuasion might say, well, my church bans use of any kind of contraceptive, and we might see that kind of an argument made later, but that hasn't come up yet, as far as I'm aware. Okay. So, uh, yeah, go there ahead, are, of Daniel. course, a substantial. There are, of course, a substantial number of Americans whose uh, religious uh, bodies, at least uh, in theory, are opposed to any kind of contraception, uh, any kind of artificial contraception at all. We'll see whether there's a case like that at some point. But this case, you said, in the ruling was very narrow. Well, it's a very narrow set of circumstances. There aren't that many closely held corporations that are going to be um, required to provide uh, contraception, and then they're going to be owned by people who object to those specific contraceptives. But I think um, millions of Americans are opposed to, or at least uh, are members of religious institutions whose formal position is opposition to any kind of contraception at all, and so one could easily imagine them uh, saying, well, this is contrary, it's contrary to my religion to provide any kind of contraception, and I think the same reasoning as was applied by the court majority in the Hobby Lobby would then apply to uh, provision by those people of any kind of contraception at all, but um, one interesting aspect of the case, it seems to me, is that um, what this had to do with, in part, was the uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act. You know, we had the, uh, the ruling from the court a couple of decades ago in the Smith case where um, Justice Scalia said for the majority that if you have a general uh, public policy that's not targeted at a particular religion, and then it happens coincidentally to tranche on that particular religion, well, that's just too bad. It's neutrally applied, and it wasn't intended to target the religious body, and so uh, those people are just going to have to live with it. If that were the sole uh, legal provision at issue, if the if the uh, Establishment Clause or the Free Exercise Clause were the only thing at issue in Hobby Lobby, then it seems to me the Smith reasoning might have applied, but we have had this Religious Freedom Restoration Act in which the court has I'm sorry, the Congress has said, well, no, Smith is too narrow a protection for um, religious people, and so uh, we're going to have a statutory statement that we don't expect federal laws, uh, say federal statutes, um, to impinge on uh, free exercise in particular uh, in this way, um, and that was the chief ground of the, religion, of the uh, holding in the Hobby Lobby case. So, if it had been a naked constitutional matter, I think it's easy to have argued that Smith meant that um, those employers were going to have to go ahead and provide all 20 forms of contraception or else get out of the business of employing people. Um, but, um, again, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, governed the outcome of the case, it, it seems. Now, what significance is there to uh, Hobby Lobby being a closely held corporation? Uh, maybe we see this further to apply to other types of corporations as well? Or was that a deal breaker in well, this case? A closely held corporation is different from, uh, uh, you know, General Motors or, or AT&T right. or Microsoft. In that, uh, a closely held corporation, of course, is one in which there are very few owners and one might think that it was a more personal uh, endeavor of theirs than 
um, say Ford is of people who own stock in Ford. Um, the court put some stress on the notion that when you had a closely held corporation, essentially you were ordering individuals to uh, take these steps that might violate their religious commitments. And that, I think that reasoning doesn't apply to the vast majority of certainly publicly traded uh, corporations. So uh, on the other hand, it's not impossible to see, or it's not impossible to come up with an argument that there might be even publicly traded corporations whose uh, founding principles were contrary to some kind of mandate, and so um, in cases involving them, the, there might be similar carve-outs from the PPACA's requirements, but again, there hasn't been a case like that, so um, we don't really know what the court would do. I mean, what this always amounts to is um, how appealing an argument people who are on one side or the other can make to Justice Kennedy. <laughs> And uh, in this case, he, uh, he came down on the side of uh, people who were arguing that the, the statute should be read um, as, that is, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act should be read as applying in this case. And so the, the owners of Hobby Lobby won. I don't know that it's going to have very significant ramifications, and even if... Uh, an, an ultimate result had been that uh, the PPACA's uh, contraceptive uh, requirement were carved out of the PPACA altogether. That's still not a very important uh, result. It, you know, it's, of course, elicited or you know, it's uh, the holding in this case has elicited all kinds of discussion of the uh, terrible oppression that people are going to be uh, subject to if they have to buy their own condoms or their own birth control pill. <laughs> you know, it's it's not really a, a gigantic amount of money that we're talking about. So um, it seems to me that in general, the PPACA is unaffected by the uh, holding in Hobby Lobby. Okay. Let's, let's go ahead and move on to Halbig B. Burwell. So again, just give us a quick overview of what is the uh, important aspects of the case. Well, Halbig is about, of course, it's a case that hasn't made it to the Supreme Court yet, but what it's about is uh, the statutory language of the PPACA. Um, essentially, what's happened in the wake of Congress's completely partisan voting uh, in both houses on the PPACA is that many states with uh, Republican governors, Republican legislatures, or both, have decided not to create state-level exchanges. And so, um, the incentive structure Congress created in the PPACA, which was supposed to prod states to create state exchanges, uh, has, you know, not, not come into, not come to fruition. So what this means is that you have over, well over 100 million Americans who, lives in, who live in states where there aren't state exchanges. And what the language of the uh, statute says is that uh, there will be subsidies for low-income people uh, who are being made to buy uh, uh, insurance under the uh, employee mandate in the PPACA uh, once they're purchasing um, insurance from their state exchanges. Of course, if you live in a state without a state exchange, you're not pur purchasing insurance from your state exchange as required by the PPACA. Well. The Obama administration has taken steps to extend uh, federal uh, coverage, essentially creating federal exchange uh, that applies more or less to people in the whole country whose states don't have state exchanges. And what the D.C. Circuit, and there have been division, of, I think, between the D.C. and Fourth Circuits on this question, but what the uh, D.C. Circuit panel said in Halbig was that the language said state exchange, and since people who are in the federal exchange aren't in the state exchange, they aren't uh, eligible for the subsidy that was provided by the PPACA in that provision. So, uh, what this amounts to is just kicking the support, kicking the stool out from under the uh, the seated PPACA and leaving it to crash to the floor. There's, there's really... Uh, if the Supreme Court were to follow the same reasoning, one would imagine that pretty quickly there would be a rush of Democrats in exchangeless states to uh, advocate repeal of the uh, PPACA, because then 
low-income people in their states would be required to purchase um, insurance coverage, and uh, they wouldn't be getting subsidies as the statute clearly contemplated. Uh, and of course, the statute assumed that the states, um, as they have been led to do in various other areas, would uh, quickly adopt the policy that the Congress wanted them to adopt in order to take advantage of these subsidies. It's somewhat surprising that so many of them have not, have not done that. Um, but again, the bottom line is um, here we have the, the second most important federal court saying, well, sorry, the statute clearly says state exchanges. If you purchased your insurance on a state exchange, you get this subsidy. And um, if you live in a state without a state exchange, you haven't done that. So you're not eligible for any kind of subsidy. The, the Fourth Circuit, on the other hand, said the opposite. So uh, it seems obvious that this is going to be a matter the, court, the Supreme Court is going to take up. Okay. Uh, okay. So what timetable so what, will that take? Will that, uh, what's, what's the next step? Are they, they go before all 13 judges, right, on the D.C.? Yes. Uh, yeah. Circuit Predict Appeals Court. Predictably, the Obama administration has asked for an en banc hearing, but I think it doesn't really that much matter what happens at that stage. Clearly, that this is going to end up in the Supreme Court. There's going to be an appeal from the D.C. Circuit, as there's going to be an appeal from the Fourth Circuit, regardless which side wins in the en banc hearing. You know, but of course, this is the chief. I think the chief reason why Senator Reid decided to get rid of the filibuster altogether when it comes to judicial nominations, he wanted to hurry up, put additional people on the D.C. Circuit, uh, and decided this was the only way to have that happen. So, and it was clear that that was the only way that was going to happen. So, um, likely in the end, we're going to have the same situation we had before, and uh, I don't know what kind of. Uh, rhetorical daring do the Chief Justice will engage in this time, but <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of hard to figure out exactly what kind of uh, what kind of innovative use of uh, statutory language he can engage in to reach the uh, pro-Obamacare result as he, as he did the last time around. One, of course, one hopes he wouldn't do that again. Right. I guess it's possible that he would. Yeah, it seems like his decision on the last one sort of came out of left field, or at least the justification for it. Well, the justification for it was absurd. On <laughs> several points. I know one thing he, of course, what he did was he said that um, it was a tax, that is, that the uh, Obamacare penalties weren't penalties, they were a tax, and this therefore came under the taxing clause of Article 1, Section 8. And the implication there was that the taxing clause was completely unmoored from the enumeration of powers in the rest of Article 1, Section 8, which is exactly the opposite of what Madison told us uh, about the way Article 1, Section 8 should be read in the Virginia Ratification Convention in 1788. That is, when people like Patrick Henry and George Mason, William Grayson said in the Virginia Ratification Convention, well, we have these three clauses in Article 1, Section 8, can be read as giving Congress power to do almost anything. The first, of them, the first of them is this taxing clause. They can tax for any purpose, and Madison's quick response was, well, no. They can only tax to pay for exercise of enumerated powers, such as the ones found in Article 1, Section 8. So, um, clearly, there's nothing in there about uh, providing subsidies for health insurance. And... Uh, <laughs> Besides that, there was every indication in the not only the statutory language, but the president's um, repeated statements at the time and, and the statements of Democratic leaders, especially in the House of Representatives at the time, that this, this bill was not to be understood as a tax. In fact, they denied uh, repeatedly that this was a tax, and apparently the Chief Justice's attitude was, well, it didn't matter what the people who were uh, the authors or the sponsors, the the signer of the bill thought it was. It actually was a tax. So, you know, I think the only way to understand this really is that it was facetious. For some reason, the chief justice decided I'm going to uh, I'm going to sign off on this, regardless whether it's actually constitutional in any sense. And I'm just going to find some kind of legal argument to decorate that conclusion with. Uh, borrow a turn of phrase used by one of his predecessors on the court in the 1960s. So, 
Um, maybe he will have reconsidered by the time the case comes up again, or the matter comes up again, the general matter of the constitutionality of the PPACA comes up again. Or, um, you know, maybe there will be a change in personnel by then. Um, who knows what will happen, but I, I don't think he exactly acquitted himself well in that performance. <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you have any uh, prediction as to what you think the final result of uh, the Affordable Care Act is going to be? Well, I think I, end, actually, it's going to stand up, or is it going to be completely changed or gotten rid of? Well, I predicted on numerous radio shows before the first PPACA decision that uh, there would be a five to four vote to uphold it. Um, I got the wrong Republican. I, I thought it'd be <laughs> um, but uh, it, you know it. It seems now that that um, the Chief Justice is kind of in tandem with the Act. I don't know what he's thinking about or how he thinks of these matters, but it seemed really that at the time there was no way to understand what he did in the other case other than he just decided he was going to find some way to uphold the Act. So. I can't imagine he's going to have changed his mind on that score by now, and the way to, around that will be to side with the Fourth Circuit and say, well, when the uh, bill, when the law says a state exchange, it means a state exchange or any other kind of exchange that the president <laughs> makes. Uh, yeah, it's a sad, it's a sad commentary, though. It's a, an illustration of the or a manifestation of the phenomenon that Tom Woods and I described in Who Killed the Constitution, that basically we all know that they're going to invoke the Constitution, but then they're just going to do whatever they want. That that seems to be what the Chief Justice is doing in this regard. So let's okay. see, I think we have just maybe a little bit more time left to discuss Riley v. California. So if you can... Oh, just... well, Riley v. California is... <laughs> Case. Um, it, it involves two amendments to the Constitution, the Fourth and the Fourteenth. The Fourth Amendment, of course, part of the Bill of Rights, is the one that ha has provision about unreasonable searches and seizures. And uh, we see from uh, the time the Bill of Rights was sent to the states with a preamble in 1789 saying that the reason for the Bill of Rights being proposed by Congress to the states was that people were concerned that the federal government was being granted too much power. Um, in 1833, in a unanimous decision, Chief Justice Marshall said for the court that everybody knew that the first ten amendments were a limitation solely on the federal government. Um, beginning in the second decade of the 20th century, people on the Supreme Court in particular began saying, well, the 14th Amendment can be understood as making some of the provisions of the first eight amendments enforceable by federal courts upon state governments, which, of course, is nonsense because the whole Bill of Rights was a federalism provision. You can't enforce a federalism provision against the state. You know, it's nonsensical. So, anyway, we have this incorporation idea underlying Raleigh versus California because what it purports to do is to enforce the 14th Fourth Amendment via the Fourteenth Amendment's Due Process Clause, and this is what's called the Incorporation Doctrine, upon the state of California, state government of California. And what had happened here was that a fellow uh, being stopped by a traffic cop had a phone, cell phone, in his pocket, and and uh, ultimately the cops searched that and found various kinds of incriminating evidence in uh, his cell phone, and and so the court faced the question whether it was an unreasonable search um, for them to have searched the uh, contents of his cell phone. And by a narrow vote, the court said, well, yes, it is an unreasonable search for, um, they didn't consider the incorporation question, which basically all of them except for Justice Thomas treat as a closed issue. Um, but. Uh, they said, yes, this is an unreasonable search, and so disallowed it and said in the future that policemen should not feel uh, generally at liberty to search people's cell phones because of traffic stops, which, you know, uh, of course, one finds uh, an attractive policy outcome even while noting that what the court actually did here has no basis whatsoever in the Constitution, and in fact... <laughs> 
amounts to usurping the uh, rightful authority of uh, state courts, state constitution makers, and state legislators over behavior of their police in this regard. What has Justice Thomas said about this in the past, then, that makes it not a closed issue with him? Well, he said here as he's, well, <laughs> he's the one who really takes seriously, I think, um, the idea of originalism, that is the idea that the Constitution should be understood as meaning what, or particular provisions should be understood as meaning what their um, ratifiers uh, or the legislators, depending, understood them to mean at the time they adopted them. And so he has uh, mentioned unhappiness with the incorporation doctrine in various contexts, just as he has also indicated unhappiness with the contemporary uh, Commerce Clause jurisprudence that leaves Congress at liberty to do just about anything it wants um, since the revolution of 1937. So um, I think that if we had a, a Supreme Court of Thomases, we'd have uh, a system, an actual federal system, where most significant domestic matters were left to uh, people to decide through the Republican process, mainly through state legislative elections, as the Constitution was intended to work. But um, although he occasionally can draw another vote or two for a, uh, an opinion based on this argument, uh, he's essentially a one-man caucus here, just as the late Chief Justice Rehnquist was a one-man federalism caucus when he was an associate justice. So it's a he's kind of uh, crying in the wilderness here. So I heard a rumor that you were writing a book about Thomas Jefferson. Yes, I am. I am. <laughs> it's called. It's going to be called Thomas Jefferson Revolutionary, and it's not a biography like my last book, which is a biography of Madison, focused on his constitutional thought. But instead, this Jefferson book is about Jefferson's radical or revolutionary ideas. So I'm currently writing a chapter about his uh, take on the place of American Indians in America. Uh, after the coming of the white man, after the establishment of the Republican governments uh, in the United States. And there are also going to be chapters on federalism, on independence, on education, on uh, criminal law, and various other things that Jefferson, who was a very prolific, profoundly successful legislator, uh, took up from time to time. But people don't recognize him as a, a profoundly uh, important legislator, but he was. Um, I think um, the Declaration of Independence's significance is exaggerated, but the uh, work Jefferson did in the Virginia General Assembly was extremely important. Uh, he, for one thing, he wrote the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom. Um, he wrote a thoroughgoing revision of Virginia's criminal law, getting rid of what he called its sanguinary nature, that is, removing the gigantic um, set of um, crimes that had had the capital penalty uh, in the colonial period and narrowing them down to just treason and murder um, and changing the Virginia's um, property laws so that intestacy did not involve primogeniture or entail and also providing that women inherited equally with men. I should say that daughters inherited equally with sons um, and he made various other changes like that. So that's what the book is about. It's, it's, as I say, it's not a biography. I'm not going to talk about where, you, you know, what day he was born, that kind of stuff. <laughs> or me, silly, as it has ever since high school. Um, but uh, there will be a lot in there about the reasons why Jefferson is a really important figure. And, oh, and of course, there will be material in there about slavery, which I think actually... Uh, Jefferson had interesting thoughts about that are unfamiliar to most people, who even who think they know about him. So it's a different kind of an exercise from writing the Madison book, because Madison was fellow basically with one kind of interest, which he followed doggedly throughout his career. Um, Jefferson took up every kind of question and seemed to master many of them. And, oh, I left out course, that he was a just a genius of an architect. In fact, in 1976, when the American Institute of Architects was polled and asked the question, what is the most significant American architectural achievement, they overwhelmingly said the University of Virginia. So uh, Jefferson was the one responsible for the fact that our public architecture tends to be uh, a classical. 
this was his idea, and actually he was the one who des designed the uh, original um, Virginia State Capitol in Richmond, which today, because it's had new wings added, it doesn't look anything like it did when he made it. Uh, the central section is his section, but it's it's kind of grown wings since his day. And originally, it was a big rectangular uh, copy of a Greek temple in southern France. So uh, he's responsible for that. Uh, he he was a man of many kinds of inspiration, and, and this is what I'm writing. About. Very interesting. Yes, it is yes. very interesting. Thank you. Good. Um, so, what other books have you written so far? You have the Politically Incorrect Guide to the Constitution. That's and, true. Uh, and your book about James Madison. Right. Right. And, and, and uh, who killed the Constitution? And, and what else do you have? Uh, well, my first book, which was a, an abridged version of my dissertation, is called Virginia's American Revolution. The topic there was the way that Virginians made their society into a Republican society during and after the Revolution. So, uh, essentially, deciding to get rid of King George, people might have thought would be the end of it, and then fighting with him to eliminate his authority from Virginia, you might have thought that would be what the Revolution was about. But as soon as they did that, they realized there were various other uh, elements of their traditional society that had to go with them. So, for example, one I mentioned a few minutes ago, changing... Uh, in pesticide rules, that is changing the inheritance law regarding real estate, um, was a natural outgrowth of getting rid of the king. If you weren't going to have a king, you didn't want to have these monarchical rules that kept large land holdings in the hands of first sons from generation to generation so that, as in England, you'd have a, a wealthy set of a few landowners who were perched atop society. So Jefferson decided, well, we have to get rid of that, and other people agreed. Of course, Virginians invented the idea of written constitutions. The first written constitution adopted by the people's representatives in the history of the world was the Virginia Constitution of 1776. The book deals with that, and various other of these things, you know, of course, the slavery issue, public education. These are all kinds of matters that are considered in Virginia's American Revolution, which the more I think about it, the more interesting I think about it. So, <laughs> so how, how can our listeners follow your work? Well, okay, there, there are various things to do. One is take a look at my website, which is kevingutzman.com. You can also follow me on Facebook and Twitter. I'm uh, at Kevin Gutzman, and of course, uh, Another thing is that I'm a faculty member at libertyclassroom.com, which is a place where you can go to find uh, recorded lectures um, and to have interaction with faculty members in, as the website says, the history and economics they didn't teach you in school. So it's uh, an alternative to the Keynesian economics and politically correct uh, race, class, and gender <laughs> that you get, uh, well, in law school too, but that you course get in high school and when you're an undergraduate studying these questions. So uh, Tom Woods, Brian McClanahan, some other good fellows and I are all involved in that effort. It involves um, not only lectures which are both audio and video online but also uh, available in MP3 downloads. But then there are periodic Q&A sessions online with the faculty members. You can, you can post questions to forums and find further information and so on. It, that's a lot of fun. I, I've got um, courses on America to 1877, American constitutional history. My most recent one is a, a class, I think, of 19 lectures about the American Revolution. So I've quite enjoyed Liberty Classroom. Again, it's at libertyclassroom.com. Just thinking about all this stuff is making me tired. So <laughs> <laughs> I have too many irons in the fire, but those are a few places to take a look. Very good. Uh, thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. And, I was happy. Uh, yeah, ho hopefully we can do it again sometime soon. Sure, that'd be good. Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Wake Up Call podcast. If you would like to listen to more episodes, please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes, or subscribe on Stitcher. And check out our website at wakeupcallpodcast.com. There you will find show notes pages and comment sections dedicated to the show. You can also email us at contact at wakeupcallpodcast.com if you're interested in being interviewed for the show or have any other suggestions. Thank you.